This week on Jerusalem Dateline, the White House announces U.S. President Trump will visit Israel on the day Israel celebrates the 50th anniversary of the reunification of Jerusalem. He hosted Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas, but warned about incitement. There can be no lasting peace unless the Palestinian leaders speak in a unified voice against incitement and hate. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell, coming to you this week from the Jewish Quarter, where sights and sounds of many of the visitors coming and going to the Western Wall and the Temple Mount. U.S. President Donald Trump is forging ahead with the ultimate deal, peace in the Middle East. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas visited the White House, where Donald Trump raised some concerns. Jennifer Wishon reports. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas arrived at the White House without the usual fanfare afforded visiting heads of state. Weakened by rivals back home, he was anxious to meet with President Trump and solidify his position as chief broker for the Palestinians. There can be no lasting peace unless the Palestinian leaders speak in a unified voice against incitement to violate and violence and hate. There's such hatred, but hopefully there won't be such hatred for very long. Trump also raised concerns about the Palestinian Authority sending payments to the families of convicted terrorists in Israeli jails. Abbas laid out his own demands. Mr. President, it's about time for Israel to end its occupation of our people and of our land after 50 years. President Trump will reportedly travel to Israel later this month, a trip that will coincide with the 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War, leading some to speculate he'll use the occasion to announce he's moving the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The Arab world respects a strong horse, and even if you're doing something that they may not necessarily like, if you're decisive and swift and strong about it, a lot of times they respect that. President, President Trump says he's eager to facilitate, mediate, and arbitrate name. a deal, but ultimately the solution must come from the Israeli and Palestinian people. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Other foreign policy issues facing President Trump is U.S.-Russia relations, the ongoing Syrian civil war, and the crisis in North Korea. Dale Hurd reports. The Kremlin says Russian President Vladimir Putin and President Trump agreed during a phone call to step up U.S.-Russian diplomatic efforts on Syria. It could signal a thaw after some, including the president, have said relations between Moscow and Washington are at an all-time low. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson in Saudi Arabia. Well, it was a very constructive call that the two presidents had. Very, very fulsome call, a lot of detailed exchanges, so we'll see where we go from here. The White House said the two leaders discussed setting up safe zones in Syria. The U.S. is also working with China on a stronger U.N. Security Council response to North Korea, including sanctions. After Pyongyang's repeated ballistic missile launches, the most recent missile test on Friday failed. And Congress has passed legislation that would intensify financial pressure on the North. Military pressure is also being brought to bear. U.S. Air Force B-1 bombers have conducted what are called presence missions near the Korean Peninsula twice in the past two weeks. In a move designed to show North Korean leader Kim Jong-un what he's up against. A THAAD, Terminal High Altitude Area Defense Missile System, is now operational in South Korea. That angers China, which sees it as a threat to its security, and Beijing has demanded its removal. It's even triggered protest by some South Koreans, the people it was sent to defend. The Trump administration has been greeted by so many foreign policy crises in its first 100 days. One political cartoon shows Barack Obama tossing President Trump a foreign policy hand grenade. In addition to North Korea and Syria, there's also Iran's nuclear program and ISIS. And none of them look to be resolved anytime soon. Dale Hurd, CBN News. In other news, the Islamic group Hamas is saying it's no longer calling for the destruction of Israel. That announcement is part of a new political program, apparently intended to end its international isolation. Still, Hamas also says it refuses to recognize Israel as a state, and it isn't renouncing violence. And it also wants to liberate all of historic Palestine, including what is now Israel. 
A spokesman for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says the new plan is an attempt to fool the world, but that it will not succeed. It's ironic that I'm not standing too far away from the Western Wall and the Temple Mount, but UNESCO, the UN group, voted to disavow any Israeli sovereignty over Jerusalem. On the bright side, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said fewer countries voted for the anti-Israel resolution. 3,000 years ago, Solomon built his temple there. This is the same temple that Harold, uh, that was rebuilt by the exiles of Babylon. It's the same temple that Jesus uh, visited when he overturned the money changers' tables. He didn't do this in um, a monastery in the Himalayas. He did it in the Jewish temple here. And UNESCO said a year ago that we have no connection to the Temple Mount. This year, they didn't say that. That's an improvement in the march of absurdity. 100 U.S. Senators wrote to the Secretary General of the United Nations and said, Enough! The theater of the absurd, when it comes to Israel, has to stop. The Al-Aqsa Mosque behind me is one of Islam's most recognized structures. Long before the UNESCO vote, just a rumor about Israel undermining that site sends Muslims around the world into a frenzy. It's a dishonest tactic aimed at undermining not only Israel, but Judeo-Christian values as well. It's one of the most holy and contested pieces of real estate on earth, the Temple Mount. For decades, Islamic leaders have incited Muslims to violence by telling them that the Al-Aqsa Mosque is in danger. First, they claim that the Israelis were undermining its foundations to make it collapse. Now they also say it's a threat even for Jews to pray on the sacred plateau. Extreme uh, movements believe that Israel is planning to build the third temple and to uh, destroy their holy shrine. Known in Arabic as the Haram al-Sharif, or Noble Sanctuary, it's the place where two consecutive Jewish temples once stood. The second was destroyed in 70 AD by the Romans. Now, Muslim mosques occupy the site. The Golden Dome of the Rock to my right is the most identifiable Muslim shrine on the Temple Mount. But it's the gray-domed Al-Aqsa Mosque to my left that Muslims consider the third holiest site in Islam. Al-Aqsa was first built in 705 AD. In Muslim theology, the site precedes the Jews and goes back to creation. You know, Adam, when he descended from the heaven, he came here and he was pray here. No, no difference between uh, Suleiman and King David and all the prophets is all the same. They've all been in Al-Aqsa Mosque. Today, the entire plateau is referred to as Al-Aqsa. Nadav Shragai wrote the Al-Aqsa is in danger libel, the history of a lie. He says when Muslim leaders want to unite the masses, they claim it's in danger. The match that ignites the people and brings them to the streets and causes violence is this libel. Al-Aqsa is in danger and this is baseless. Archaeologist Dr. Gabriel Barkai says there have been excavations near the Temple Mount, but never under it. One of the cornerstones of Western civilization was never touched by the spade of the archaeologist. Barkai says it was Muslims, not Jews, who began digging in an attempt to rewrite history. Since the 90s, there were many uh, destructive diggings going on in the Temple Mount, which were not for archaeological purposes, but the contrary, for destroying archaeological data. According to Shragai, then Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini started the libel against Israel in the 1930s. He accused the Jews of wanting to collapse the mosques on the Temple Mount. That led to Muslim rioting and murder of the Jews, just the first of many incidents. Islamic expert Dr. Yitzhak Reiter says the tactic hasn't lost its potency. They really believe in what they think, that Al-Aqsa is in danger as long as Israel is controlling the eastern part of East Jerusalem. In 1969, the Muslim world blamed Israel for the arson attack on the Al-Aqsa Mosque by a visiting Australian Christian. That lie continues today. More trouble in 1996. The worst Israeli-Palestinian violence in 30 years broke out when Israel opened an exit for visitors to the Western Wall Tunnels half a mile from Al-Aqsa. And in 2004, Rain, snow, and a minor earthquake toppled the entrance ramp to the Temple Mount. That provoked an international Islamic uproar, 
when Israel tried to rebuild it. We asked Muslims in Jerusalem what they think. It's in danger. To destroy him, to took the place, it's in danger. They are digging underneath it and digging and digging and they don't find anything. God will save it. <laughs> Experts say it's important the West takes notice now because millions of Muslims believe the lie is true. They say if it brought violence in the past, it will do so in the future. Coming up, a behind the scenes look at the making of CBN's new epic docudrama, In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline here in the Old City. In less than a month, Israelis will celebrate one of the greatest military victories of all time, the Six-Day War and the reunification of the city of Jerusalem. In tribute to what many see as God's victory, CBN documentaries produced In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. CBN Scott Ross interviewed the writer and director of the film. By 4.30 a.m., the Israelis had reached the Jordanians' command bunker. For the next 45 minutes, they lined the opening of the bunker with 21 pounds of TNT. This is Ammunition Hill. This is a site of what is still today the bloodiest battle in Arab-Israeli history. I talk with In Our Hands, the Battle for Jerusalem writer and director, CBN's Aaron Zimmerman. The docudrama tells the story of Israel's victory in the city during the 1967 Six-Day War through the eyes of the paratroopers. Did you do reenactments here? We did. The people who run Ammunition Hill were very great to us, and they let us have the run of the place for two and a half nights. We had snipers shooting from the bunkers. We had them crawl through the grass, up the hill, through the barbed wire. They even showed us the original bunker. The battle kind of ended when the Israelis got to the top of the hill, and they found the Jordanian command bunker, and they took 21 pounds of TNT and blew that sucker into next week. And so they showed us that and they said, well, you're welcome to use this bunker again to stage your explosion. And we thought, great, you know, if it survived a real explosion, it can survive a fake movie one. Based entirely on facts, the film includes dramatizations of important scenes like Commander Moto Gore talking to troops on the Mount of Olives. We are sitting on a ridge overlooking the old city and soon we shall enter it. The old city of Jerusalem, which generations have dreamed of and longed for. We will be the first to enter. And running through the streets of Jerusalem under threat of sniper fire to take the Temple Mount and Western Wall. We had done another docudrama, The Hope, about the beginning of Israel. And we thought, what's the next chapter in that story? And we went to 67, and, and it's such a great story. And we thought, well, let's not do a dry documentary. Let's get to know some of the men who actually lived it. And digging into all the background, historical data, et cetera, that must have been an enormous undertaking. I tried to use primary sources as much as I could. I tried to use people's diaries. I tried to use minutes from Israeli government meetings. I used personal interviews. But all of the dialogue in the film was recorded in history. As a result of the war, Israel tripled in size, beating the combined armies of Syria, Egypt and Jordan to win the Golan Heights, the Sinai Desert, and Judea and Samaria, and reuniting beloved Jerusalem. To cover the whole war would take too much time. So we narrowed it down to the Battle of Jerusalem, and then we narrowed it down further to one group of men, the 55th Paratrooper Brigade. And I really liked them because they weren't regular army. They were the reservists. They were a little bit older. They were the husbands and the fathers and the businessmen and they were the guys that ended up going into Jerusalem. We shouldn't wait for that to change. Let's go. Step on it, Benzo. I mean, these actors are very realistic. Oh, they're great, yeah. Did it have an effect on the actors themselves? Because it's more than just history. This is their, in many cases, their fathers, their grandfathers. They're depicting this. How did they respond to that? 
I had a lot of guys tell me their personal family histories. I had so many guys say to me, well, my grandfather was in the Holocaust, or, or my grandfather, in one case, Sharon Friedman, who played Motegor, his grandfather was one of the guys who fought for Jerusalem in 48 and saw the whole siege and everything. The little woman who came and offered up the flag, she wanted that flag to be used and flown. At the Western Wall. At the Western Wall. I mean, that brought tears to my eyes. Oddly enough, the paratrooper, Yoram Zamosh, who's part of that story, and I asked him, did you ever see that family again? And he said, we did. And he said, a few months after the war, the old grandmother had passed away. Really? Like she was waiting. She had lived through getting kicked out of her home in 48, and she had lived through all of that, hoping to see Jerusalem reunited. From start to finish, Zimmerman worked on the film for just a year. But was there anything that you uncovered, something unknown, not something that you just didn't know anything about at all? What was interesting to me was the response to the paratroopers. When they came into town, they were heroes. These families came out. Now keep in mind, there was also a blackout because of the Jordanian shelling. There was all of that going on, and still these women would come out of their houses with food. How did it affect you personally? From the film side, I learned what an amazing thing can happen when everybody works together, and you have so many good people doing what is their specialty, whether it's training the army, whether it's doing makeup, whether it's doing explosives. What I took away from the war, there are two things you can do in life. You can practice and plan and plan and just the hard work and living something to see that result come out the way that it did. Or you can be in a situation like the paratroopers where you train for one thing, then life throws you another way. And can you adapt to that? I asked Zimmerman what she wants the audience to take away from the film. Oh, well, two things. I, I tried hard to keep it as apolitical as possible to give it a wider audience. So number one, I want them to see the sacrifice that these men made. Number two, we went back 20 years to 1948 to what happened when the Jewish quarter fell and the Jordanians ethnically cleansed every Jew from the old city of Jerusalem. And then at the end of this segment, the Jordanian officer says, we have so completely destroyed this place that no Jew can ever return here. So then we fast forward 19 years and show how they did. And what will Israelis think of the film? I hope it will be good. I want people to take away a pride in their heritage. And after all the bloodletting and everything else that's occurred here historically, <laughs> there's no way that Israel Jews are going to give up this city. No. I don't think so. I mean, Moshe Dayan said it when he got to the Western Wall. We've come to the city never to depart from it again. Scott Ross at Ammunition Hill in Jerusalem. CBN will be showing this docudrama in theaters around the country on May 23rd. If you, your group, church, or synagogue would like more information, go to inourhands1967.com. Up next, Israel's birth. Some say it's miraculous. Welcome back to Jerusalem Dateline. Israel celebrated its 69th birthday on its Independence Day. Back in our studio, David Nekrutman, the executive director of the Jewish Christian Center for Cooperation and Understanding, told us what he believes is the hand of God on the birth of Israel. So a year after the establishment of the State of Israel, the chief rabbinate said, this is such a miraculous event. Remember, 2,000 years being divorced from your land, and like it says in Isaiah 66, 8, a nation will be born in a day. Well, that's exactly what happened. We prayed and hoped for this. Now it's actually here. This is an extraordinary event that deserves praise. To me, the best answer to any atheist is explain the existence of the Jewish people. There's no logical reason in the world that we should be here today. It's only by God's unfailing love for His people, for His covenantal word. And this is my biggest proof, the state of Israel. If God is faithful to me, He's definitely faithful to you as a Christian. So why can't we just come together and acknowledge and praise God for the restoring of Israel in our lifetime? Would you say many of the conditions that existed in 1948 still exist today when Israel is surrounded by enemies that want to destroy it? Well, that's Psalm 118. For me, that's sort of like the basis, even though we're surrounded by all this. Death is always lurking over Israel. 
This is Psalm 91. Like when, I can tell you this, when the rockets were going over Netanya, Psalm 91 came to mind. It's not the Iron Dome that protects us, it's the God Dome. It's His hand. There could be 10,000 arrows, 10,000 rockets. At the end of the day, there's this miracle that happens that God's protection is over this land. We wake up in miracle every single day in this land. And just walking the land, you just, you feel God's presence more than any other place in the world. Coming up, a breathtaking look at Israel's independence after 69 years. Welcome back. Modern Israel turned 69, and Israelis celebrated their anniversary with memorials, picnics, and fireworks. Here's a video of some of the celebration in Jerusalem, and an example of what you can see on our Facebook page. Take a look. It's a two-minute siren right now. You'll see people just standing in remembrance of those that died. Well, that video is exciting and an example of what you can see on our social media. Well, that's it for this edition. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.